On December the 1st, 1145, Pope Eugene III issued the bull Quantum Predecessores, which called for a crusade to reclaim Edessa. The cause was quickly embraced by King Louis VII of France and Emperor Conrad III of the Holy Roman Empire, leading to a surge in momentum for the project. However, it was Bernard of Clairvaux who was responsible for amassing the largest number of men for the campaign. Meanwhile, in the newly established Kingdom of Portugal, King Afonso I sought the support of the clergyman in his quest to conquer another city, Lisbon. Lisbon had been under Moorish rule for centuries. The monk realized the importance of confronting the Muslims on two fronts, and informed King Afonso that while most crusaders would be traveling to the Middle East by land, others would navigate around the Iberian Peninsula by sea to reach the Mediterranean. By that time, Lisbon was already one of the oldest cities in Europe, having been founded around the 13th century BC. For all its history, it had been important, either under the Roman Republic and Empire, as well as in the different Germanic kingdoms, Muslim Caliphates, Emirates and Taifas. For the Crusaders, conquering it would mean a great victory for Latin Christendom, and for the Portuguese, the control of all the Tagus Valley, therefore a serious advancement in the Reconquista. On May 23, 1147, an armada consisting of almost 200 ships departed from Dartmouth. On June 16, it arrived in Porto. Just a few days prior to its arrival, King Afonso instructed the bishop of the city, Dom Pedro Pitões, to welcome the crusaders warmly and encourage them to stay and aid the Portuguese in their efforts to reconquer Lisbon. The next day, the bishop delivered a compelling speech in Latin to all the crusaders urging them to stay and reminding them of the importance of the mission. Some of the crusaders quickly agreed to participate in the quest. Nine days later, the Bishop of Porto, along with the Archbishop of Braga, Don João Peculiar, and a significant number of crusaders departed from Porto by ship to join forces with the Portuguese host, led by King Afonso, who was already waiting for his allies on the northern outskirts of Lisbon. The majority of the soldiers accompanying the monarch were infantrymen, although there were several cavalrymen in these ranks as well. Additionally, a group of crusaders who had become separated from the rest of the crusading fleet in Galicia joined the king. This operation was deemed of utmost importance, and many of the most distinguished nobles in the kingdom were present, including the highly experienced Gonçalo Mendes de Souza, who had been accompanying the king since the days of the county. Furthermore, several bishops had also joined their ranks, including the Bishop of Lamego and Viseu, who were later joined by the Bishop of Porto and the Archbishop of Braga. When the Portuguese host and the Crusaders united, their combined armies numbered 13,000 men, with 3,000 of them being Portuguese soldiers, and the rest made up of Crusaders from various regions, such as England, Normandy, Flanders and the Holy Roman Empire. The Crusaders brought a diverse range of troops, including lancers, archers, arbalists and slingers. The English and Normans were led by Irvi of Glanville, Simon of Dover, Andrew of London and Sir of Archel, while the Germans were led by Arnold of Arschut and the Flemish by Christian of Gistel. On the Muslim side, there were approximately 15,000 soldiers and over 60,000 civilians sheltered within the walls of Lisbon. Among the soldiers were a significant number of skilled sappers, crucial for digging countermines, as well as experienced artillerymen. The primary line of defense for the city were the impressive fortification walls, boasting a thickness of 2.5 meters. In addition, the walls were complemented by 25 towers, further enhancing the defensive capabilities of the city. The inhabitants of Lisbon also possessed trebuchets, which were similar to those utilized by the opposing crusaders. Late in the morning of the 28th of June, the Crusader fleet entered the Tagus River. The majority of the troops remained aboard the ships, while a small contingent of Anglo-Norman soldiers, led by Hervey of Blanville and Sayer of Archel, disembarked. Shortly after their arrival, the first skirmishes took place a few hundred meters away from the western suburbs of the city. 
The Crusaders emerged victorious but refrained from pursuing the fleeing enemies, cautious of a potential trap. Instead, they set up camp at the same location, leaving a contingent of 40 men to guard it against a possible night raid. All the soldiers slept armed to maintain readiness. On the 29th, the Crusader leaders and King Afonso finally met to discuss the payment. Afonso expressed he had limited resources available due to Portugal's involvement in various ongoing wars. Consequently, many Crusaders were dissatisfied with the proposed payment, except for the Flemish. Some Englishmen even threatened to depart for the Holy Land immediately, but Hervey of Glanville successfully defused the situation. A day later, the conditions were finally agreed. The Crusaders would give Afonso military aid in exchange for the right to sack the city after the conquest. Furthermore, trading privileges would be issued to these men as well as their descendants. The city would then pass to the king, who would distribute property as he wished. Not long after, the Flemish and German ships departed to the eastern part of the city. At the same time, a Portuguese delegation, which included the Bishop of Porto and Braga, was sent to the city to negotiate the peaceful surrender of the Moors, but they refused, believing that they had enough supplies and manpower to resist the invasion. Shortly thereafter, the Crusaders finally landed. The Normans and the English made their way to the western mount known as Fregoso, modern-day Carmo, while the Germans, Flemish, Scots and Britons headed to the eastern side. The Portuguese remained positioned on Mount St. Jens, located to the north of the city. Lisbon was thus surrounded. No supplies could enter. On the 1st of July, the Crusaders initiated their offensive by hurling the first rocks from the Arrabal, located to the west and north of the city. Their objective was to compel the enemy to engage in open field combat. Eager to engage in close quarters combat, the Anglo-Normans swiftly advanced, driving the Muslim forces towards the center of the Arrabal. However, the Islamic adversaries received support from the residents positioned atop their houses, who commenced firing projectiles and launching attacks against the Crusaders. Recognizing the escalating difficulty of their advance, Sayer called for reinforcements, eventually managing to dislodge the Muslims from the Arrabal. Meanwhile, on the northern side of the city, the Portuguese Crusader army advanced against the Muslims in the Al Mukabar, which was a Muslim cemetery. Once again, the victory belonged to the Christians. Following the conquests, these two areas were swiftly occupied by a force of 3,000 men. Although a small group of crusaders attempted to pursue the fleeing Muslims into one of the city gates, the majority of them remained behind. They were too few to effectively chase their Islamic rivals, and therefore had to return. Thus, the first day of the siege concluded, with the Christians having achieved two great victories. Furthermore, in the eastern Arabal, due to the rapid Christian successes in the west and north, no defenses had been assembled. Consequently, the Germans and Flemish took advantage of the situation and seized control of the area. The first day had been a great success for the Christians, who had achieved a resounding victory with minimal losses, gaining full control of the outskirts of the city. The Muslims were now confined within the city walls, closely monitored by the Crusaders. Additionally, eight small ships were stationed to the south, effectively encircling the city by land and sea. Moreover, the Portuguese and the Northern Europeans found many cereals hidden under the houses of the Arrabalge. The age-old setback of hunger during medieval sieges would not be a problem. Over the following two weeks, the Muslims attempted to lure the Christians closer to the city walls through raids on the outskirts. 
However, their efforts failed to achieve their goal. Although they did inflict enough casualties to necessitate the establishment of two cemeteries. One cemetery was dedicated to the fallen Anglo-Norman soldiers in the west, while the other honored the German Flemish soldiers in the east. From mid to late July, the Crusaders devoted their efforts to constructing various siege weapons. One prominent weapon was the movable trebuchet, requiring a hundred men to operate it. These powerful engines launched multiple rocks, with claims by Glenville stating that 5,000 were hurled within a span of 10 hours. Additionally, two siege towers were erected to transport troops to breach the city walls. The one built by the English was 30 meters tall, while the Flemish and Germans built another one equipped with a battering ram and fortified with wood to protect against enemy attacks. On the 3rd of August, the Flemish and Germans initiated an assault on the eastern side of the city by launching rocks from five trebuchets. However, the Muslims successfully set fire to the tower by throwing fiery objects, successfully destroying it. Simultaneously, the Anglo-Normans attempted to maneuver their siege engine to the southeastern side, but encountered difficulties due to the slippery ground. Exploiting this disadvantage, the defenders destroyed the English siege tower in three days, using their own trebuchets. Consequently, the Crusaders sought an alternative approach, resorting to mining operations to destroy part of the city walls, allowing their forces to then enter the city. However, the Muslims became aware of this strategy and devised countermines to impede the Christian progress. Despite the Allied army setback, some Muslims within the city plagued by anger, began to flee and surrender to the Crusaders. This fleeing group was then baptized, converting to the Catholic faith. No Allied army came to assist the Muslims, as the only potential aid could have arrived from the Taifa of Hevre. However, the Taifa's ruler opted to not intervene due to a peace treaty he had signed with Afonso I, which he could not risk violating. Moreover, the Portuguese had positioned troops miles away from the city to intercept any incoming assistance, successfully preventing outside reinforcements. In mid-September, German and Flemish sappers commenced the construction of a new mine, measuring 25 meters wide. A month later, on October 16th, the Crusaders set fire to the mine underneath one of the foundations of the city walls resulting in the collapse of a 60-meter-tall section. This particular wall stood before the highest part of the castle. The Germans and Flemish immediately attempted to enter the city, but encountered impassable terrain due to the debris from the blown-up wall. Additionally, the Muslim defenders persisted in their resistance. Subsequently, the Anglo-Normans sought to exploit the breach by attempting to enter, but they were prevented by the Flemish and Germans. The credit for the breach belonged to them, and they were determined to claim the glory of entering the city first. Simultaneously, in the southwest, the Anglo-Normans continuously launched projectiles from a newly constructed siege tower, measuring 25 meters, which had been fully financed by Afonso. Their target was the city walls and doors. On October 19th, following a mass, the Christians embarked upon the arduous task of pushing the tower westward. However, they eventually abandoned this effort and redirected their attempts to the southern part of the city. This sudden change caused panic among the Muslims as their defenses were primarily concentrated on the western side of the wall. Despite the Muslims' attempts to impede the Christians, they were unsuccessful as the followers of Christ stationed on the top level of the tower effectively repelled the attacks with arrows. As night fell, the Christians seized their assault and left the tower near the southern walls, safeguarded by 200 Portuguese and Crusader knights. Nevertheless, Muslim soldiers emerged from the walls with the intention of destroying the tower. They received support from other soldiers who launched fire projectiles at it. However, the Crusaders successfully withstood each assault. The Muslims ultimately abandoned their attacks and retreated to the city's interior. On the afternoon, the tower was incessantly pushed by the Portuguese and Germans. Eventually they got 1.5 meters away from the walls. The assault was seconds away of coming to fruition, but 
Upon witnessing the bridge of the siege tower opening, the Muslims inside the walls finally surrendered to the Christians, requesting a truce until the following day to negotiate the terms of their surrender. The victory marked a significant triumph for the Portuguese Crusader army, ranking among the greatest conquests of the Second Crusade and the Middle Ages. Fernão Pérez Cativo, the chief steward of King Afonso, and Hervé of Glenville led the discussions with the Muslims, delivering five hostages as a gesture of their commitment. For a day, the Christians debated on the transition of power and the subsequent pillaging. Finally, on the 25th of October, after more than three months of siege, King Afonso made his entrance into the city. Accompanied by ecclesiastical authorities and crusader leaders, he traversed the full circuit of the walls, known as the Chemin de Ronde, symbolizing his ownership of the city. Palmelo was abandoned by the Muslims and subsequently occupied by the Portuguese. In due course, the castles of Sintra, Vila Franca, Povos and Arruda all surrendered to the king. Remarkably, within a span of seven months, the Portuguese conquered the entire central region of the country, even extending their domains into southern lands. <laughs>